This is the Unseen World of the Bible, Session 8, about the sacred space or holy place. We have some learning objectives, some goals for today. At the end of this lesson, everyone should be able to define the English word holy as used in the Bible for God, for objects or things, and for human persons. And secondly, you will be able to distinguish the difference between sacred space, impure space, and hostile space. Hostile is in enemies. And thirdly, you should be able to explain to anyone what is substitutionary atonement. Atonement meaning being brought back together through a substitute. Offers a theme for this lesson. Although we be unclean sinners, we are holy if we are in Christ. Although imperfect, our imperfections are overlooked by God because of Jesus. It is that simple, yet that profound. Remember, when you read a verse aloud, we're not only speaking it to each other, we are speaking it into the spirit world, before the Lord, before the angels, and before the demons. Moses took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant. So here we're talking about the giving of the first covenant that God made with the people of Israel. There was something written out perhaps a tablet of stone, and he read it aloud to the people, and they agreed, yeah, we will do it. Did they ever do it? Well, from time to time. But then he took the blood of the sacrificed animal, and he sprinkled the blood on the people. Why blood? Why not clean water? Without blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. But we know that from the New Testament. And the New Testament hadn't been written yet, so why do you think they used blood? Moses is going to explain why blood in a moment. Obviously, if you take enough blood out of any living thing, it dies. Why sprinkle the blood on altars, that pile of stones, books, or and in this case, persons? It was a symbol of covering with the blood of Jesus. It's something like that. It's, it's an imagery. It's, it's a ritual. But the blood, in a sense, the light has been taken out of a beast, an animal. And now that light is being applied not only to persons, human persons, but to objects and places. What does it do? Well, we're going to suggest in this lesson that the blood represents substitution. That is, animal blood is substituted in the place of human blood. So, substitution happens when one creature, creature means created thing, when one creature suffers death in place of another. Now, most evangelicals are very familiar with this, especially in regard to our personal salvation, but we don't often think about what it was doing for the places and the objects and the books in the first covenant, in the Old Testament. Well, this has something to do with holiness. When you hear the word holiness, what's the first thing that comes to mind? God, okay. Separate. Separate. Yeah, very often we, we think of those terms, uh, which is not far off the mark. In fact, it hits the mark. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say that he told me because I ordered God in holy. Okay. Now, some Christian denominations, when they talk about holy, what they mean is an unblemished lifestyle. Someone who, whose behavior is impeccable. There's nothing wrong with it. Our term holiness reverts here back to the Lord himself. Yahweh. And now here's what he means. Usually when the Bible introduces an unusual word, 
it will provide its own definition somewhere in the verses preceding or following. Do not turn to idols or make metal gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. Remember, metal idols were the most expensive, the ones that the stronger spirits would come live in, according to common belief to this day. Remember, I am holy, so don't turn to any other gods. All right, offer a definition now. In regard to Yahweh, the Lord himself, what does holy mean? Distinct. He's distinct. He's different. He is totally other. Yahweh God is so different from every other being, everything he created, that we are never to think that he is in any way the equal of an idol or the gods that live in idols. So let's offer here a tentative definition. Tentative meaning we'll try it and see if it works. When used of God, the term holy means something like totally other, completely different. But when used of people, we do not go to other gods, meaning we remain loyal to Yahweh alone, the God of the Bible. So the fact that he is holy implies that we must remain holy, loyal to him. But now, what happens when we sprinkle the blood on objects, not living things? In this case, they mean separated off for God, belonging to him, or dedicated to the God of the Bible. So when we build a chapel and hold a dedication service, what are we doing? Exactly. We're, we're offering up this new meeting place to the Lord himself for his honor. A long time ago, like 55 years ago, here at Powers Baptist Church, we would sing a song. And what was that song, Jennifer? Every Sunday morning. This is why, in, according to the Bible, humans must approach God through rituals and rules. That is, God himself sets out specific steps that we have to take to come into where he is dwelling. And it has to be by ritual, a defined way of behaving. We have to, to understand what is meant by atonement. I will set my face against any Israelite or any foreigner residing among them who eats blood, and I will cut them off from the people. What a strange rule. God says you must not eat blood. What is he doing in this verse? Find out a rule. For you, my special people Israel, you are not to eat blood. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. The word atonement probably means something like purification. In other words, the Holy God is able to come back together with unholy people through the correct ritual and process. So, three meanings of atonement. The original meaning of the Hebrew word kafeh means to cover. In fact, our English term cover may have come from Hebrew kafeh. Uh, but secondly, when it is used of a deity or of the Lord, it brings the idea of appeasement. Or if you had offended someone in ancient times and you wanted to make amends, come back, be reconciled, you might bring a gift, and that would appease, that would put them at peace with you. But then when used in rituals, our term means to purify persons, places, or objects. At least symbolically purify them. Make them acceptable to a holy God. Does that mean the same as cleansing? Purify kind of implies that this is ritualistic. Uh, so you can think of 1 John 1, 7, for example, the blood of God's Son, Jesus, cleanses us from all sin. It's the same concept. That which was done symbolically with animal blood in the First Testament is accomplished once for all by the blood of God's Son, Jesus, in the New Testament. The places where we have lived in the past, I have been present 
at the sacrificing of sheep. In one instance, it was the Feast of Eid. We were in the capital city of an Islamic country. I was invited to the, the big national mosque, and there the, the president of the republic was present, and I got within about 20 feet of where they slew the sheep by slicing its throat, letting the blood run into a, a hole carved in the ground. But then what astounded me was that many of the most important men of the country came by, dipped their finger in the blood, and applied it to their forehead and walked away. So I asked later, why did they do that? What does that mean? And the answer I got from others was, oh, that's for the forgiveness of sins. So this brings up a distinction between purity or sacred things and impurity or profane things. I'm going to suggest seven ideas to be tested from Scripture. This is kind of a, an attempt at doing biblical theology. First, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, He is life. Much more than that. Secondly, wherever Yahweh dwells, there is sacred space. So, if He, in some special sense, comes to dwell in your tent, your tabernacle, your temple, or your church meeting, that becomes sacred because he's there. Thirdly, wherever Yahweh dwells not, there results death, defilement, hostility, and evil. Life. Every space is sacred, ordinary, hostile, or evil. Now, I've mentioned before that other countries where we have lived and worked, we had the idea of, safe, of clean spaces and defiled spaces, or dirty spaces. And so we had to learn, when we came into a place, whether first to remove our shoes. Huh? Then we could step in. The main room of everybody's house was a clean space. But if we stepped out of that and moved back into dirty space, and you're, you're expected to put your shoes back on. Visually, you couldn't tell the difference. So sometimes I had to ask, is this a clean space or a dirty space? And they would always reply, oh, sir, this is a clean place. Please remove your shoes. Fifthly, impurity results from, Bible lists a lot of them, bodily fluids. Virtually anything that comes out of the human body in any quantity defiles the person files the place where they're standing or lying. Discharges, disease itself, or if anything has died, a person or a beast, anything, uh, anything that was living has now died, it is impure. And if you touch a dead thing, you become impure. And which required then some kind of a ritual to remove impurity. So you can imagine that how often would most people become impure? Daily affair. We created persons, we creatures, we approach Yahweh only by invitation. It's He who says, I want you to come. But we have to come through purification. We must be purified, lest we risk death. And seventhly, substitutionary blood atonement provides for ritual purification from impurity. So, a beast, an animal, dies in our place. Does that really give us life, for eternal life? No. Does it give us real forgiveness of sins? No. But it, would, it teaches us a lesson that approaching the Holy God requires that we be purified. Seven more things. Blood sacrifice ritually purifies our approach to Yahweh. Just a few observations. First, Yahweh created us humans to live with Him forever. That's what He wanted from the beginning. However, human sin has resulted in death for everyone. The scripture says, because of the sin of Adam, death has passed on to all of us. 
Human life remains more important than bestial life, that is animal life, because humans are Yahweh's imagers. He created us to be in his image, that is, that we should rule over the earth. God did not give to any other creatures the right and duty to rule over the earth, only the humans. And so that makes us the, the image of God and why we are more important than the rest of his creatures. So whenever an evolutionist right, points out how smart primates are, or how clever birds are, or how linguistically astute other animals are, they're trying to make us equal. And in some sense, we are. However, none of them was made the image of God. Fourthly, sinful humans cannot enter sacred space. Well, they can, but would likely result in their death. You can think of uh, some scriptural examples of that happening. Or those who inadvertently touched the Ark of the Covenant and were zapped instantly fell dead. Yahweh, however, remains merciful towards us sinful humans. He really wants to solve the problem. He still likes us. And so what he did Yahweh provides us a blood substitute that rectifies, that makes, sets right our defiled, unclean state, temporarily under the Old Testament and permanently under the New. Thus, humans may approach sacred space through ritual sacrifice. Well, let's try to illustrate this from a number of instances throughout the Old Testament. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden east of Eden, the very point the man had formed. Right, so that place called Eden, a garden, he puts the man there. So the man is now in a sacred space. Eden was sacred because Yahweh dwelt in Eden. He walked with his creatures. He placed on the east side of the garden. Cherub. Cherubim, or cherubs. In other words, these powerful angelic beings, angels of some kind, were also in the garden, and they were guarding the gate after the humans were excluded. After the humans sinned, they were no longer allowed to dwell in the sacred space. They were driven out. Another instance of sacred space, Mount Sinai. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not face their way through to see the Lord and the man and the marriage. When God came down on the mountain, it became sacred, and so there was a warning. I have not invited anyone here but Moses. And so warn everybody, do not approach. In fact, another passage says, Keep your herds away, the animals too. If they come up on the mountain, they will perish. They will die. So even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves. Yes, yeah, so the verb consecrate relates to the adjective sacred or purify. So even priests, even though they are officially appointed as the go-betweens, they also must be purified ritually before they can come before the Lord. All right, let's look at another example in the tabernacle. Uh, most of you have studied in the past how the tabernacle was laid out and how only the priests were allowed to enter. And the first thing that they had to do was make burnt offerings of animals, beasts that had been slain, and then carry their blood inside to the holy place. And once a year, bring the blood all the way in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Here's why. So make the tone and cover of your gold, two naps of his long, and two and a half wide, and make two cherubim out of hand of gold at the end of the cover. What do these two cherubim remind you of? Where have you heard of read about cherubim before? The game seems to mean. And what about gold? Where did we read about gold before now? The book of Genesis makes a point that in Eden there was much gold, very fine gold. And so the use of gold again reminds the people of Eden. Make a lampstand of pure gold, hammer out its base and shaft, and make its flower of cups, and blossoms. 
Why does the scripture make a point that it had flowers, buds, and blossoms as part of the motif? What would that remind folk of? Creation. Creation and the Garden of Eden. Very lush place with all kinds of trees and plants and fruits. These sacred places were an attempt to provide another tiny Eden. We excluded from the first Eden, but at the tabernacle, the priests were allowed to come back into a tiny Eden and meet, meet with Yahweh there, but only by sprinkling right. blood. Later on, the tabernacle was expanded into a temple. And there's good reason to believe from scripture that the old tabernacle was never dismantled. It was carried into the temple and was set up there. King David rose to his feet and said, listen to me, I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord for the footstool of our God. Excellent. Yes. However, David was not allowed to build the temple. You remember why? Why was he rejected? He was a man of war. He was a man of blood. In other words, he killed too many men. Sometimes when he was just angry with them. He, Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, he arranged to have him murdered, killed in battle. And remember what scripture had said. You are not even allowed to slay an animal for sacrifice. Only the priests are allowed to do that. On the walls all around the temple, both the inner and outer rooms, he carved the cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. Uh, he also covered the floors with gold. Oh, oh. Again, you see the same motifs. The temple, again, provides a dwelling place for Yahweh in the midst of the nation. A limited place, the temple, but the glory of the Lord did come down and inhabit, it entered into the temple, and the priests again, and only the priests were allowed to approach him through blood sacrifices, because it was a sacred place, right? There's more. Because Yahweh was dwelling in the temple within the nation. Do not entice, entice yeah. to bow him down and worship him, things the Lord your God has. Apportioned appropriated to all the nations. Do not be tempted, enticed, to worship anything that Yahweh himself had given to the nations. Well, we know from other lessons, what was it that God had given to the nations? Other lands? There are places where they would dwell, but he put someone in charge. Spiritual prince. A, a spiritual being, maybe an angel of some kind, was put in charge of each of the other nation groups. Many of those were called stars and were believed to actually be visible when they would travel around in the sky as stars or planets. So he said, do not be tempted to worship the gods of foreign countries. But as for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace, out of Egypt, to be the people of his inheritance as you now are. Although he assigned the nations to other gods, he himself remained the God of Israel. Why do you suppose he calls Egypt a, an iron smelting furnace? He was purifying his people. He was purifying them. And he purified them while they were living under what kinds of spiritual rulers? They were living under the gods of Egypt. And many times they had to bow down in front of those gods. It was a legal requirement. And then at the Exodus, Yahweh demonstrated his power over the Egyptian gods by judging every one of them, including Pharaoh himself, who was believed to be and dwelt by which god? Horus. Yeah. After death, the Pharaohs would be incarnated by the god Osiris, the annually resurrecting god. So he's reminding them, you came out of that background. If you then become corrupt, make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, your God, and arousing his anger, then you will quickly perish from the land. Are you Israelites, you do not have any 
special rights to come into my presence if you're defiled by other gods. You must be purified just as much as any Gentile would have to be. You do have the advantage, though, of my law. I've told you about these things. I've put it in your scriptures. I have provided the place, the sacred spaces, and I provided the sacrifices by which you can come into my presence. So, do not become corrupt, defiled, or impure through any kind of an idol or foreign god. If you do, your will arouse his anger against you. And did that happen? Yes. 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 Did they ever perish from the land? They did. Then we have this strange biblical story of the two goats. This is how Aaron is near the most holy place. He must first bring the animal for purification offering. Now I took out the term sin offering and I put in purification offering. I've looked this up in Hebrew and in Greek and other translations, and there's nothing about sin in the, in, the, in the scores of verses that use this term. The offering purified you so that you could, again, approach Yahweh. Did it just purify Aaron? Well, did, well some did purify Aaron or the, his, his descendants. So there were these, these purification offerings for priests, for books, for altars, for worshipers, for the nation. And in this case, we have a special kind of offering that consists of two goats. And he is to take the two goats and present them for the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other four. Azazel. What do your Bible translations say instead of Azazel? Some call it a scapegoat. The Hebrew is very clear, and the Hebrew expression, Le Yahweh, for Yahweh, and Le Azazel, for Azazel. So it looks as though we have one goat for one kind of spirit being, the Lord, and another goat for a different spirit being, whose name was Azazel. Is that possible? Would God provide an offering that would be given to a demon? Well, many scholars suggest that Azazel was a known name of a wilderness demon. Four meanings have been suggested by scholars for what this term means. First one we just looked at, possibly it's the name of a demon. Others say it was the name of a place. You send that goat to the place wherever Azazel might have been. Later on, instead of just sending that goat into the wilderness, Jews began taking it out into the wilderness and throwing it over a cliff to make sure it would fall to its death. And they called that place Azazel. However, they weren't doing that during the time of the Bible was written. Others suggest that, well, that's just an idea. Azazel means lostness, or separation. So we'll send this game go to carry our sins away. The fourth one being says, well, Azazel consists of two Hebrew words. Uh, so there's a document on the site, David Turidot online, that you can look at and download, taken from the Lechem Bible Dictionary, and kind of summarizes all of that. We're going to come back to the Azazel idea shortly. And he is provided sacrifices of ox, a lamb, or a goat in the camp outside of it, instead of bringing, bringing it to the entrance to the tent of meeting, that person shall be considered guilty of bloodshed. God earlier had said, do not eat blood. Now he puts up, gives us another rule. If you're going to offer an animal as a point of sacrifice to, for Yahweh, you are not allowed to slay it alone in the camp or in your home. You can slay an animal at home if you're going to consume it or sell the meat. But if it's for the Lord, you must bring the, lie, the animal alive to the priest so that it can only be slain by the priests. And who slew Jesus? We'll come to that. Uh, otherwise, you become guilty of murder. They must no longer offer any of their sacrifices to the goat, demons, or uh, sayer. Right. Uh, to whom they prostitute themselves. Yeah, so here's a problem. Uh, even the Israelites that were no longer sacrificing to gods, many of them were still make, giving offerings to 
local little spirits that dwelt outside of the camp, uh, out in the wilderness, as they called it. And some of the, they used a term for a hairy goat to talk about those demons. And so by sending Azazel out into the wilderness, the Lord puts a stop to all the offering to demons. So by sending a goat out into the wilderness to the big demon called Azazel, the, um, it's taken care of. Now, so the Lord takes the sins of the people, the priest puts the sins of the people on the goat, the goat is sent out into the wilderness to Azazel, and that's all you need. In other words, sin has gone back to its source. The word may mean something like hairy one, or a goat, a buck demon, or what in mythology we call a satyr. Let's think about Jesus for a moment in light of Azazel. Oh, by the way, if you want to read about Azazel, book of uh, First Enoch, talks of quite a bit about Azazel, as well as the Jewish apocalypse of Abraham. Jesus was the one that spread into the world of the world of the this tempter, what might his name be? In fact, historically, men have said, well, that was Azazel, or Azazel is some kind of an analog, prefigurement of the tempter himself, the devil. And so where did Jesus go? Went out into the wilderness. The wilderness was hostile space. It was not sacred space. And there he goes out in the wilderness and he meets Azazel, so to speak. Azazel attempts to entice him to sin the same way in which he had enticed Adam to sin many centuries earlier. But Jesus succeeds in resisting temptation. Thank you, Jesus. Not only is Jesus the scapegoat who goes out and meets Azazel, Jesus is now also the first goat which was sacrificed and whose blood was used to purify the sacred space. So Jesus fulfills the function of both of those goats. And in so doing, he breaks the power of the one who not only can kill, but becomes the lord of the underworld. Hell, that is the devil. All right, if that's not enough, let's remember what scripture says about the heavenly place, the heavenly sacred space. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect ever. All right, so Jesus Christ becomes the high priest of the new things, and there is a more, a greater and more perfect tabernacle, the one that is in the heavenly places. And that's where he took his blood. He entered into the most high place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Right, redemption, meaning he paid the price. Right. Uh, and it lasts forever. He'll never have to do it again. And we've, he's already obtained it for himself. But he obtained it for us. Right. But he paid the price. Yes. So, so he is in the most holy place in the very heavens itself, in, in our behalf. And remember the back at the beginning, when the covenant, the first covenant was given by Yahweh to Moses on the mountain, the tablets on which it was written were sprinkled with blood. And at the Last Supper, Jesus had this to say. After the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is, for, is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So we now have a new covenant, but different blood. Not the blood of beasts, but Jesus says, This is my blood. In essence, he was saying, From now on, when you celebrate your center meal, don't think about the goat that was sacrificed for the sheep under the old covenant. From now on, you are to think about my blood and my new covenant, my new agreement. And then we have these promises that have been given us. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. 
the deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Underscore the phrase, I take away their sins. Between Yahweh and us who have faith in Jesus and remain loyal to him, sin is no longer a problem. Our disobedience, our imperfections, our bad habits, our failures to obey, none of that any longer separates us from Yahweh. So just put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you and risen to give you new life and just stay loyal to him. Never give up your faith. You can never behave well enough to earn merit or favor from Yahweh. Though you can live in a way that pleases him. Jesus prayed later, Father, sanctify, that is, make these believers holy just by your truth. Your word is truth. And of course, he had brought us the word of God. For them, I make myself holy so that they also may be made holy. The term sanctify, kind of a strange English term, means simply to make holy. And then our bodies are sacred space. We know that if he, earthly tent, live in this destroyed, we got a building through God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Why do you suppose he chose the term tent? It had a temporary. It's temporary, and tent also recalls the tabernacle, which was a tent. And so the bodies we're living in are sacred space, but they're temporary. We have a more permanent body awaiting us in the heavens. So that's called a house. Houses stand. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. That's what makes you sacred. Scripture has a lot to say about how to treat this body. And you yourselves are God's temple. It is collectively. When we gather here in our, for our celebrations, for our services, for our Bible studies, our service projects, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, by his Holy Spirit, is not only in our bodies, he dwells in our midst. And so this room right now is legitimately a sacred space. The Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the second of loves, in whom we have redemption. He can transfer us from Satan's realm into Jesus' kingdom because Jesus has provided the forgiveness of sins, the purification that we require to be in his presence forever. Why is it called the kingdom of the Son? Why didn't he say the kingdom of God? I would like to suggest that as long as the power of darkness remains in the earth and we belong to Jesus, we're in the kingdom of the Son. The time is coming when the Son of God will bring back to the Father all that he has redeemed, all of the, all of the human beings that have become faithful to him. Then the, comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule, all authority, all power. What? Is God going to stop ruling? God will have no more power? Now, what do we know about that phrase? rule, authority, and power, as used by Paul. It always refers to evil spirit beings that are ruling over the earth. 